Lovely to see you all this morning. There'll be, uh, there'll be plenty of time to chat and have a cup of tea or coffee afterwards, so if you're able to stay and have a drink with us, that, that'd be fantastic. We'd love to, we'd love to see you. And a uh, warm welcome to you. My name is Kieran, one of the uh, pastors here at the church. And this morning, we're going to be looking at, we just started a series. So if you're, if you're new to the church here, what we do each week, we have some time. Really enjoyed, uh, thanks so much, Dan and the team. Really enjoyed that this morning, worshiping God. We'll uh, go back into a song at the end of my talk. But what we do as, as a church, and pretty much this is standard across all churches, is a moment where we want to praise God for who he is. And that's part of what it means to be with, with Jesus, is just saying, Jesus, you're amazing. Uh, but also, there's a moment where we want, actually, to hear what Jesus wants to say to us. One of the primary ways, if you're thinking about, I want to be with Jesus, if you want to know what it's like to be with Jesus, I encourage you to open the Bible. If you, if you want a Bible, we can give you one. We've got free Bibles here. Uh, and have a look at some of the things that Jesus said. And, and really, that, that's kind of how my, my story started. That's actually uh, what really how I began as I started to look into these things. So we're doing a series at the moment uh, in a book in the Bible called Acts, and we've entitled it Turning the World Upside Down. Because when you read that book, and we'll be going through it over the next few weeks, you'll see amazing stories of what God did through ordinary people like you and like me. So if you've got a Bible here, I'm going to pick up on a couple of verses in Acts chapter 4 to give you a context of this. Some of you might have heard Jim's excellent talk last week where he referred to this passage. But prior to this, what had happened? Jesus Christ had come. He'd been crucified on a cross. But to prove he was God, he was raised to life. He appeared to, at one time, over 500 people as well as to individuals. And he spent time probably six weeks or so, on the planet, after he'd been crucified, risen again, spending time with his friends, his followers, his disciples. Then he ascended back into heaven. God poured out the Spirit of Jesus on these believers, this small group of people. And Jim picked up on, on really some of that story last week. And particularly, two of them were going to, actually they were going to pray. One of the ways you can connect with God, if you want to think, how do I connect with God? You can talk to God. Prayer is just talking to God. I don't know if you know this, but recently a survey was done, I think a poll of over 2,000 people were asked, uh, do you pray? In the UK, 51% of adults say they pray. That's that's over half. And that's not people in churches, that's just adult population in the UK. And prayer is a great way If you want to be with Jesus, you you can pray. Well, Peter and John, these two friends of Jesus, they'd been with Jesus. They went to the temple. They saw this lame man. I don't know, maybe it was a prompting from God just whispering in their ear. The guy looked, begging for money. They said, silver and gold we don't have, but what we have in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And that's what happened. The guy got up, his lame legs, he'd been lame, uh, disabled, He got up and walked. There was a a crowd gathered, an amazing scene. And the people that actually had crucified Jesus, the religious authorities, they took Peter and John, and they're like, they're not happy. And they asked them to give an explanation. And we read here in Acts chapter 4, I'm going to read two verses. This is part of their explanation. Salvation, verse 12 is found in no one else talking about Jesus, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. They were really clear, and I want to make it really clear this morning. I want to make it clear to us here. I want to make it clear if you're watching this on YouTube. If you've stumbled over this uh, this morning, I want to make it really, really clear. There aren't many roads that lead to God. Jesus said, I am the way. He said, I am the truth. He said, I am the life. He said, no one comes to God except through me. And I know that's offensive, but that's actually the words of Jesus Christ. So when they said salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved, that's why. And then they went on to say, and it goes on to say in verse 13, 
when they saw, so this is the religious people who hated Jesus, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men. Do you know, I, I, Jim picked up on this last week. The original Greek, if you're a scholar, you look into the original Greek. I'm not a scholar. I read it in a book. Uh, the original Greek for unschooled and ordinary, unschooled was actually idioti. <laughs> I want to say this morning, I am an unschooled, ordinary person. You all know I'm an idioti, don't you? <laughs> It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. And as a result, they they turned the world upside down. And that's the thing, you see, when, when you spend time with Jesus, everything changes, and in one sense, nothing changes. Because this isn't some sort of cult. Following Jesus isn't like a cult where God wants to take your personality and make it like everybody else's personality. No, you can be the most you you could ever be when you meet with Jesus. So in one sense, nothing changes. All those years ago when I had this encounter with Jesus, in some ways nothing changed. I was still tall, dark, handsome rude (laughs) but in another way everything changed I wonder if you put up this this slide this is uh, a photo of Fetter Lane in London many many years ago in Fetter Lane in London a number of people that had been with Jesus got together And they thought, you know, we have a passion to see the nation change. Because the nation, I guess when we look at our papers, when we look at uh, the internet, we can see the mess that our world is in. And and actually, the tragic things that happen in our own country, in our own neighborhood even. And they were people that were being with Jesus. And they thought, you know, we're going to gather and we're going to pray. They were inspired by some... Moravian people that, that spent 100 years. We did a 24-7 prayer week. So that means every hour for 24 hours, every day for seven days, you guys prayed. It was magnificent. Well, the Moravians did that for 100 years. And this group were inspired by them and thought, why don't we meet on New Year's Day to pray? And they prayed and gave thanks to God. They asked God to meet with them because they wanted to be with Jesus. That was nearly 300 years ago. Two of the people, or three of the people in that room, if you've been around sort of church world, you might have heard of them. John Wesley, Charles Wesley, another one, a hero of mine, George Whitfield. They were just ordinary, unschooled people. And God powerfully met with them. John Wesley, in his journal, recorded this. At about three in the morning, so the 1st of January, 1739, about three in the morning, as we were continuing instant in prayer, whatever that means, the power of God came mightily upon us in so much that many cried out for exceeding joy and many fell to the ground. They met with Jesus. And if you know anything about that period of history, we're on the brink of revolution like the French Revolution, and it's said by secular historians that uh, the way that the country heard about Jesus through actually principally these people that were gathered there it changed the course of our history as a nation. Right the way and through to the 19th century. So you've heard about the abolition of slavery through Wilberforce, uh, the great work that people like Shaftesbury did, Robert Rakes, who really started education as we know it. They were all people that actually became friends of Jesus out of that move of God called the Great Awakening in the 18th century. And Fetter Lane, this is where it happened. The church is gone now, it's just office blocks, Fetter Lane. Many years ago, I was a God hater. I'd come from a slightly challenged background, and a bit like Dawn's story, I could see, now I look back and I see, actually, you see, because I've met with Jesus, everything's changed, but nothing's changed. I'm still the same person, full of insecurities back then. And there came a moment 
when some people told me about Jesus, and if you've been in this church, you'll know this, they gave me this, this Bible. I just showed this to Tim, and I said, look what I found in here. It's a, it's a travel card dated the 28th of June, 1991. If anybody wants that, you can sell it on eBay, probably. He said he was 13. <laughs> so they gave me this Bible. And I thought, you know what? I've got this sense that I want to be with Jesus. So I said, why don't you read Luke's account of Jesus' life? And that's what I started to do. And I felt him come and melt my heart. See, many, many years ago, I loved Dawn's story. I can remember there was a moment when I was growing up when uh, the violence was so bad in my home that my mum was fighting off, trying to protect me from somebody that was trying to attack me, and she told me, run. As a young kid, I don't know how old I was, I fled the house, and I went to the park, the local park. I didn't know Jesus. But in that moment, I just, in my, in my pain, because I was injured, I cried out to God. And somehow he heard my prayer. Because do you know what? In Fetter Lane, where I worked for Ernst & Young, somehow trying to make myself look great and grand by having a high-paid job, but deep down being deeply insecure, in Fetter Lane, all those years later, I met with Jesus. I wonder if it was that group of men prayed on that spot and said, you know what, may this nation be changed. May people that are broken be fixed by you, Jesus, just like you fixed us. I don't know. One day I will know because I'm going to ask them. You know, maybe I'm the answer to your prayers, George Whitfield. You see, we're unschooled, ordinary people. Please, I'm not trying to insult anybody here. I look out, there's many people far uh, more educated and able than I am. But before God, we're, we're just like children. Fetter Lane, amazing, isn't it? All those years later. I wonder if you pop this next slide up. That's the back of somebody on that picture where it says life. That's Billy Graham. So I became a Christian when I worked at this company, in Ernst & Young, in the city of London. And when I became a Christian, I randomly bumped into the senior partner's PA, and she said, you know what, I, I've been with Jesus as well. And she said, there's a group of us meet at lunchtime, why don't you come along? And I wasn't sure, because I thought, oh, that sounds a bit weird. But I went on, five people, and we used to meet together, and we used to pray pretty much on the same spot that John, Charles, Wesley, George Whitfield, all those guys prayed. And we prayed that our nation would be changed. And way back in the day, Billy Graham, some of you might have heard of him, probably the greatest evangelist, teller of Jesus of our generation. He died recently. You may have seen that on the news. Well, he came to do a mission in England, and the five of us, we prayed, we schemed, and we invited the whole of Ernst & Young to come and hear Billy Graham. We put these posters up. There were teaser posters, so it said, the one with the white background, those posters were teasers. They were all over the UK, those posters. What does that mean? Elif? And eventually what they did was they put the life posters, come and hear one man who can make sense of life through Jesus Christ, and that's Billy Graham. And we put these posters up in our office, and people would rip them down. But I had an unlimited supply of posters. <laughs> Nobody's going to outpost me when it comes to encouraging people to meet this Jesus that had changed my life so radically. See, because when I met Jesus, I realized actually that God loved me the way that I am, but also he didn't want to leave me that way. He wanted to pour his love into me so much that my heart could be transformed and healed so do you know what? Now I'm happy in my own skin. I'm not perfect, you know that. Those of you who are in us, you know that. But he can do that for you. They, they took note that Peter and John, we read in the Bible, they, they'd been with Jesus. And do you know how we change into everything God wants you and I to be? It's just by being with Jesus. 
It's not simple. It's not difficult, folks. It's really simple. So we put these posters up, and people came and heard Billy Graham and his massive crusades. You got five of us. I wonder if you put the next slide up for me. Number 37 there is Jack. Jack, give me a wave. Stand up, actually, Jack. Jack Jack pointed out this morning that he's actually turning into me. He's now wearing clothing like me as well. (laughs) Thank you, you may sit. So Jack, if you haven't worked it out, he he sometimes does announcements and stuff. Jack is related to me. Uh, We're brothers. (laughs) (laughs) So this picture was taken at the the UCI World Cycling Road Race Championships in Perth in Western Australia. Jack's number 37, you can see he's representing Great Britain and you can see some of the other nations represented. That's at the start of of that race. Why am I showing you that? Well, when we, Jack and I had the privilege of going with him uh, as his, I don't know, just prayed over him or something. I don't know what I did, but anyway, I was there. when we were there, we, we were sort of sightseeing around Perth, and we noticed a small group of people standing in a circle. And I said to Jack, I said, they're Christians. Not because they, they were like strangely dressed or were carrying a cross. Or I said, they're Christians. They've got to be. Anyway, long story short, we got into conversation. They were Christians. They were praying in the center of Perth. They just said, let's go and pray for our, you know, and uh, they were there. So we got talking to them, and I met this guy, he was English, he wasn't Australian. I met this guy, and I uh, you know, was chatting to him. I said, so what, what are you doing over here? And he, he explained that he was working with a Christian organization there. And I said, so, so is that what you've always done? He goes, no, no. He said, I'm a management consultant working for Ernst & Young in London. So you're a Jesus follower, so he's been with Jesus, but he's working for Ernst & Young. So inevitably, I said, oh, I used to work for Ernst & Young. It's a financial institution. And I said, you know what, we used to have a Christian union, a a group that used to meet to pray, five of us. And he goes, well, that's remarkable, because now there's 1,000 of us. And the firm give them a budget of three and a half grand a year to put on events in the firm where they can invite interesting speakers and carol service and stuff like that, so more people might be able to be with Jesus. See, when we come to know Jesus, everything changes. Nothing changes. You know, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm standing down there before I talk, saying, God, I need you. Because I am so aware of my failings, my weaknesses. How, how did I end up doing this? Well, actually, in some ways, I felt God, you know, saying, come on, Kieran, fly. This is what you're made for. This is what I made you for. If you just said to me years ago, I'd be standing in front of people, I would have run a mile. When you are with Jesus, everything changes and nothing changes. I loved it in Dawn's story on the video um, where she said this, I dropped to my knees and begged God to save me and that I was truly sorry for everything I'd done. And you see, for us to be saved, what does that mean? That means for us to come into a friendship with God, to be saved from our sins, to be saved from hell. How how does that happen? Well, it's just a prayer away. And this is what Jesus said. This is how it happens. Simple phrase, you, that's you. That's you if you're listening to this on audio of watching it on, on YouTube. You, that's what Jesus said. You must. He said, you must. Not you might. He said, you must be born again. You must be born again. What does that mean? That means everything changes, but nothing changes. On the outside, you're going to look the same, but on the inside, everything's going to change because it's like a spiritual new start. It's like the shame goes All those things that you're ashamed of. Think of your favorite sin right now. Right, let's start with Alana and go around the room. What is it? Shut it out. (laughs) No, we're not going to do that. Everything you're ashamed of wiped away. Jesus didn't come to rub it in. He came to rub it out. A change on the inside. On the outside, yeah, you're maybe going to look the same. 
And so actually, even on the outside, things do change. I remember after this incident in Fetter Lane, when, when I gave my life to Jesus, when I became born again, when I became a Christian, I remember going out with this guy, Peter, who's a boyfriend of a friend of mine, Morag, one of my colleagues, and we were out for a drink, and he said, there's something different about you. This is after I'd given my life to Jesus. There's something different about you. I was dressed as a pirate. No, <laughs> that was a joke. There's something different about you. He said, there's something in your eyes. Uh, there was just something that I wasn't aware of. And when we're with Jesus, something changes on the inside that makes life very different on the outside. Everything changes. In some ways, nothing changes, but when we're born again, everything changes. Last week, I was with a friend of mine uh, called Simon. And Simon uh, lives in the southeast of England. And he's become a friend of Jesus as well, and he does kind of what I do. Uh, you know, he talks to people about God and does some stuff like that. And he had a meeting in a school. It's a school with 2,000 pupils. It's a, um, a comprehensive school, secondary school. And he had a meeting with, with uh, the headmaster there uh, because she'd invited him in to talk to the pupils about what it, knows, uh, what it means to know Jesus. So he's sitting down having a planning meeting with her, and she says this. She says, you know, I think it's really, really important that you talk to the pupils about the cross. And he said, right, yeah, okay. So he's making notes on his pad. Um, got to talk about the cross. But I'm not really sure what that means. So he said, well, do you want me to explain? And she goes, well, why was Jesus nailed to a piece of wood? So he drew a cross on a piece of paper, and he said, look, you know, before Jesus came, actually it was predicted in the Bible that he was going to come. And it says this, cursed is anybody that is nailed to a tree. And when Jesus died on a cross, he took the curse that is over humanity. He broke it once and for all. He paid the price on that cross with his own blood. And this is what Simon explained to her. And she said, oh, that's really interesting. I never understood it like this. And could you put this next slide up? I asked him to send me this. This is the drawing that this headmaster of t uh, a school of 2,000 people did. And you can see, I don't know why she did a picture of the sun, <laughs> but two people on one side. And she said, well, that's us, clearly, and we've done wrong things. And what she drew was that as we do wrong things, we, we've... We, we can't get to God. God is on one side of that chasm and we're on the other. And we do wrong things. And what happens is we fall into this like abyss where we need help. And she said, I, I know Jesus did something to try and help us, but how do we get out of that? And she drew this ladder. She said, is it like the good things that I do, maybe somehow they can achieve maybe another step on the ladder to get out of this separation that I feel from God? It, in some ways, it's like this. Apologies if, if you can't see this clearly. Oops. This is the drawing, so that's us here. This is God. How do you... Is it a ladder that we do? do? Do we kind of, as we're down here, we're trying to get to God, try and understand what it means to be with Jesus. Do, do we put a ladder up like on that drawing that she did? No. And this is what Quince, Quincy explained to me. He said, no, actually, this is, this is what happened. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him won't perish, but they will have eternal life. And Jesus came and made a bridge. And through his death on the cross, we can know God. And she said, that's amazing. I never understood that. And Quincy's in the office and he thought, so I'll take a punt. So he said, would you like to have a friendship with Jesus? And she said, you know what, I think I would. And he said, would you like to do that right now? And she said, yes, I'd like to pray right now 
and asked Jesus to be my friend. And in her office, she asked Jesus to forgive her. She said, I want you to come into my life. And she crossed from here to here. The ladder is history. So my question this morning to us here today is not only where you are, are you still here? Maybe, maybe you, you, you said, yeah, Jesus, I want you to be my friend. I, I, want, I want to know God. Maybe you thought, yeah, I, I know the cross is the way. But look, be, be honest. Have you somehow gone back to thinking the way you can please God and maybe is, is by going up a ladder and step by step? No, there's only one way, and that's through the cross.